The Missing Link. This podcast is aimed at defining and discussing the gap between data and SAP in the Australian market. It'll give you the opportunity to learn from leading data and SAP figureheads who have spearheaded transformations and consulted for major players in the industry. Something that is really important to the precision sourcing team over this last year has been mental health and well-being. And we are proud to partner with the Black Dog Institute and we'll be running events including this podcast and all proceeds will be going to them. Our aim is to help create a mentally healthier world today and for generations to come. If you wish to donate to the cause, please follow the link below on this podcast episode. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's for our, our first episode of um, our mini series, The Missing Link. Um, so I will be very honest, it's my first time doing a podcast um, and I'm a bit nervous, so don't mind the nerves. Um, but we have our guests, um, David Simpson and Jay Dutton, who are well-known leaders Bow-bow. in the SAP and data market. They combine have 25, oh no, 35 years of experience across SAP and data projects in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and myself, Laura Naylard from the BI team at Precision sourcing and uh, my co-host uh, Richard Shaw from the SAP team um, here at Precision Sourcing. So I guess we'd like to kick it off with a quick fire round to get to know our guests better. Um, do you want to go first? Yeah, cool. sure. So we do this just to sort of break the ice, let the audience know who you are. Um, so it's just uh, two, three minutes, just go through some quick questions. So we'll start. With, what's your full name? Uh, David Simpson. And do you have a nickname? Uh, Simo. Probably the Simo. easy Australian one where you just yeah. cut the end off. And Sounds Australian. <laughs> and whereabouts are you from? Uh, originally from New Zealand, Timaru, a small town between Dunedin and Christchurch. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously the conversation we're talking about today is data. So what do you love most about it? Um, look, I'm not sure if I really love data, but my mind's <laughs> wired to understand and enjoy it. Um, I've spent time in other areas. I've spent some time in accounting, SAP ERP, and some custom app development, mm-hmm. but I always end up coming back to data, and I've definitely spent most of my career in the data space. Um, I suppose it's a good combination of working with the business, understanding their problems and challenges, as well as also working with the technical challenges. Yeah, okay. And um, what's, the, what's the best job you've ever had? Uh, best job, um, a- a- HMV in London, um, mm-hmm. we're building their store reporting solution, um, back a long, yeah, back a long yeah. time ago, uh, probably for all of the young, all any younger people listening, <laughs> um, you know, back before, b- back before iPods and Spotify, you used to go into record stores and buy C- and buy yeah. CDs. Uh, so HMV was probably I remember the biggest. HMV, it, clo- it literally just closed down when I left the UK. Yeah, but HMV um, was the biggest um, sort of music store in the UK and also also in Australia. They were also a record label, yeah, so it was yeah. a really fun place to work. Blast from the past. <laughs> um, and what about your worst job? It's always a hard question, this one. Yeah, I was thinking about this. Look, I don't think I've had... Look, I've definitely had jobs which have been challenging, but we've mm-hmm. always learned something from them and grown from them. So I'll probably put down... When I was at um, yeah, end of high school and university, I worked worked in, worked in construction and worked as a yeah. construction labourer. So I'll probably put that one down as my worst I did, job. Um, I did two months as a mechanic. I did not enjoy it. I'm an office guy. Um, what about sport? Are you into sport? Uh, yes. Yeah, follow a range of sports, but mm-hmm. maybe my favourite would be rugby. Yeah. And what about food? Um, What's your go-to? A highly marbled Wagyu steak with a really good red wine. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what about your management style? How would you describe it in one word? Um, empower, really trying to empower people, support them to be able mm-hmm. to work by themselves. What about holidays? Any planned and where would you recommend to go? Um, I've got Queenstown, New Zealand, down as my sort of favourite destination. It's probably one I yeah. end up going going back to a lot just because mm-hmm. it's sort of you know close to home when i go over there yeah yeah i haven't been yet so i was planning to go to noosa but yeah, we went going to, to lockdown. Um, i suppose these holidays are trying to keep reasonably local with everything going on so i'm going to southwest rocks mm-hmm. which i've never been to before yeah amazing and what about a bucket list have you got anything you, you, you're looking to do Look, not a lot. I've been lucky. When I was younger, I traveled a lot. So a mm-hmm. lot of things that were on my list, I have managed to tick off. Um, I'd like to own a classic Porsche 911. Yeah. Um, but at the <laughs> moment, that doesn't really suit my car budget or sort of lifestyle with several active kids. Could be your company car and you share it. Get the Porsche 911 in. Yeah, that's an idea. <laughs> Get the branding on the side. <laughs> yeah. But uh, perfect. Thanks for going through that. And Laura? Uh, cool. Over.
Um, so, Jay, what's your full name? So, my full name's actually Peter J. DeCourcy Dutton. Oh, yeah. So, Dutton, not Button. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm <laughs> Duton. What do you call me? Duton. <laughs> Duton. <laughs> um, but, yeah, call me Jay. And yeah. why do you go by Jay? Um, oh, it's Peter. a long story. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We won't get so, into uh, it. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I think I've answered the next question, but do you have a nickname? Yeah, Dutto. Yeah, okay, Dutto. Same. Okay, Dutto. cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, where are you from? Um, country New South Wales, so um, sort of all over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all over. New South Wales, yeah. You were born everywhere in New South Wales? No, well, I was born in Moorlambara. <laughs> oh, I got No, it. I wasn't. Yeah, Moorlambara, yeah, New yeah, South yeah. Wales. I've lived in so many towns, it's hard to keep up. Okay, cool. And come to the big smoke. Um, yep. And what do you love most about data? Um, yeah, so I, I love a good problem to solve. Mm. And, you know, there's lots of opportunities in transforming and analysing data to solve problems. So oh, cool. That's probably it. Okay, cool. Not what we always hear. Um, <laughs> and then uh, your best job you've ever had? Um, I'll say there's been a few, but I think with my current job, I'm you know really enjoying the opportunity to, to grow a team and, and do what I love. So, mm. yeah. mm. Cool. And um, what would you say your worst job is? So worst job would be cotton chipping in a uni holiday. So oh, wow. 40 degree heat, walking up and down rows of cotton, chipping out weeds. Wow. Is that Lots of Australia? flies. Yeah. Oh, wow. I got really good at catching flies. So. And um, what's your favourite sport? So rugby league in the winter, cricket in the summer. Pretty standard for Australia or yeah. New South Wales. Yeah, not, not a big fan over here of the league, are you? <laughs> More union over there, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, what's your favourite meal? It would be my mum's lasagna, I'd have to say. Oh, nice. How yeah. does she do it? Uh, takes takes a whole day, but yeah. yeah. It's actually better the next day as well, so... Does she use the layers of pasta yeah, or the lay, pieces? Yeah, no, she are? layers it. Yeah, yeah nice. Yum. Um, and how would you describe your management style in one word? Relaxed. Relaxed. Yeah, okay. I'm pretty laid back most of the time. Things done, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and any plans for holidays <laughs> or where's your favourite destination? Um, I'd love to get back to Vegas when all the borders open. It's oh, kind nice. of yeah. adult playground. You know, you've got not golf, really gambling, yeah. sort of, yeah. you know. Nice yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> um, hopefully we can go soon. Um, yeah. And then bucket list thing to do. Um, I've always wanted to learn to fly, so that's still on the list. Oh, nice. What yeah. kind of? Uh, you know, My dad was flat, a pilot. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, just light aircraft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Should we jump onto the? Main round. Yeah, so we'll just jump into obviously the main part of the podcast now. It'd be good to firstly get an understanding of how you started your career in SAP and just a little bit more about your story. Look, I started my career in SAP at um, New Zealand Tourism Board. I spent my probably first six months there building a building a Microsoft Access based system um, for all their overseas offices to record their transactions and what they would um, mm-hmm. and what they're doing was sort of called the cash book. And then once I finished that, we started a project to replace that with SAP. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my first SAP project, uh, and then came over to came over to Australia sort of pretty much straight away after that. Yeah, and in terms of data, did you start your career in SAP working in the data space or from functional? Sort of combination of both, I suppose. When I first started working, even you know my first job, I was sort of doing data work, but working within working yeah. within finance teams, um, and then after I did that. Yeah, after I did that project for New Zealand Tourism Board, came over to Australia with PwC, and mm-hmm. I got trained in BW and SAP FICO at the same time. And my first couple of years, I probably did a combination of both, probably more yeah. on the SAP FICO side. Um, but then, then after that, pre- um, yeah, pretty much solely on, yeah. the, on what, the data side. What out of interest? What kept you in? What kept you in SAP after you first got a taste for it? Um, I don't know. Uh, we've, we've probably, I think both Jay and myself have probably been the SAP people who have dabbled most on the stuff outside of SAP, but still yeah. maintained in it. I think it's one of those things that once you get to know an area and, you know, and a set of data and that you've got that, you know, you've got that knowledge. So it's easier to stay there. Yeah. Interesting. So obviously you've both recently started a new business. What is it that you're focusing on at the moment? 
Yeah, so we started um, Citrus Solutions in July. Mm -hmm. um, we were getting all prepared to start and ready to start, and then New South Wales went into lockdown, which was <laughs> lots of fun. So our first yeah. three months or so of it was in was in lockdown. Look, our focus is on um, data and analytics, and we've really still got to focus on SAP customers. Mm -hmm. We'll do some work for non-SAP, but our focus is mainly in the SAP space, with, but with a slight difference. Um, we're still working with the SAP tools, but really the majority of the projects and where we're really putting our focus is on using some of the um, cloud native solutions from um, from yeah. AWS and Azure and other providers and using those to um, to solve data and analytics problems for SAP customers. Yeah, awesome, which is what we want to hear, or what I want to hear, not Richard. Um, and um, I guess my question is, what are you seeing in the market in terms of like SAP and data and I guess the missing link really? Uh, look, there's several things, there's quite a few things we're seeing out there at the moment. Um, there's, you know, looking at SAP customers specifically, there's a lot more decentralized analytics, um, a lot less where you've got the big central team providing all the reports and the analytics, a lot more of that's decentralized and spread out amongst the, amongst the business units. Now, this isn't always the case. There are still some really good central teams providing really good work, but, but in, the, in the majority, we're seeing a lot more of it decentralized. Um, we're probably seeing Power BI as the most commonly used tool. Mm -hmm. um, as far as your front-end analytics. I'm still seeing quite a bit of Tableau, and the people who are using Tableau tend to really like it. Yeah, um, we're seeing the same kind of thing. So. But in the, you know, in the SAP space, you know, your business objects is, you know, and it has been for, you know, for a few years now, has really declined. And we're seeing a lot of customers who are pretty much turning off their business object systems. Um, SAP Analytics Cloud, uh, which is a relatively new tool from SAP, although it has been around a few years now. Um, you know, it is growing in popularity. We are seeing more of it, but still relatively slowly. And its strengths really in the management reporting and planning. So it's probably really competing more with your EPM tools, your, you know, your TM1s, your ANA plans, yeah. your adaptive in insights. Um, whereas when it comes to you know, more your pure analytical um, use cases, that's predominantly being done by Power BI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. we're seeing the same with the Power BI as well. So, mm. no, in a lot of cases, what we're seeing is the current BW systems aren't really supporting your aren't really supporting your decentralized analytics models. A lot of SAP customers have sort of moved to a you know, low cost ticket based support model for the SAP environment. And that sort of works for your ERP environment, but it really kills your analytics environment. So yeah. your BW environment working in these sort of support models, you know, doesn't doesn't tend to work you know, doesn't tend to work work that well. We're really seeing a big requirement for the customers when they look at their data having, you know, sort of three silos and that you've got a three horizontal silos and that you've got sort of sample area, you know, where your specialists can go do what they need to, you know, your specialists can go do their business analysts, their data science tasks. Yeah, you know, a business unit area, maybe a few more controls around it where they can sort of blend that central data, um, you know, with their own data and come up with their own analytics. Um, and we still require that central, that centrally controlled area where you've got your core SAP data and other core systems data coming into. Um, but to really support the business now, that can't be the only part. Um, okay. all, also, I suppose when we look at big data, um, you know, all of your Hadoop-based systems um, are pretty much now moving across to your, your moving across to your, your AWSs or yeah. uh, and Google Cloud, um, Google Cloud platforms. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing a lot more in the data science space um, using you know, data science and machine machine learning tools like SageMaker. Um, but really, when you dig into that, a lot of that is people using it for data wrangling and sampled activities and people dabbling and playing around with machine learning. I think in that space, the hype curve is still you know, a little bit ahead of what's actually happening in the market. Yeah. It's interesting to hear. We see a lot when we speak to mm, customers. Changes in the market. Power BI, SEC, BW4 everything and everything they get architects in to come and try and help them choose and advise them which way to go that's what we were finding and um i guess the next question is what options do sap customers have at the moment in the market all right so there's quite a few options now and for a lot of customers they're really at a point where you need to start making where you need to start making some decisions um we've got maybe if we start out you've got the holding pattern option if you're on bw you can sort of you know, you can migrate to BW on, on um, HANA and stay on the highest version that that supports. And if you've got a nice stable system that's sort of doing what you want, you can stay there for quite a few years. Uh, 
if you've moved to S4, yeah, if you moved your ERP system to SAP S4HANA, then the embedded analytics um, really gives you the ability to take a lot of that more operational reporting um, that really clogged up your BW systems in the past and move that back into the ERP. But in our view, that's never really going to be a, you know, a full-blown analytics and data solution. Your next step up, if you're going down the SAP path, is to then move to um, move to BW4HANA. And the challenge here is this really isn't a technical upgrade. It's mm -hmm. you know, a reasonable amount of work and you know, quite a bit of work you need to do to your BW system to move to BW4HANA, um, and also a new licensing model and everything that comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really, we really see that something that the you know, the hardcore SAP um, customer who has a really good internal team's got their BW system running well, um, maybe got BPC and a bunch of other things on it. Yeah. That's a good option for them. Um, but for the yeah, but for the organisation who their BW system isn't really meeting the business requirements, it was built a long time ago, it needs some major changes, um, it's probably time to think of think of other options. Mm -hmm. uh, SAP have also released SAP Data Warehouse Cloud. Um, we're still not really sure. We quite like the product, but we're not really sure if it's ready to be a standalone solution. Yeah. We think using that to complement BW for HANA or BW to provide more flexibility to the business units could be a good option. Mm -hmm. um, but the bit we're really, I suppose, most interested in is when we look at the cloud native solu um, solutions from uh, from AWS and Azure. So for a lot of your mid-size mid organizations, when we look at these cloud native solutions, um, you can potentially go with a data lake solution. So with a data lake solution, it can be really, really low cost. We've got really effective ways now of extracting the data from USAP into a, um, into a data lake on, whether it's on AWS or Azure or Google. With the serverless processing, um, which we have available on those platforms, we can sort of process that data through to create a data with change tracking, um, you know, relatively low cost and very and very efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of cases, that's going to be a better support for a distributed model where the business units are doing a lot of analytics themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and which one is low lowest cost out of interest? <laughs> Um, I always look, get asked I think this question, you, so... <laughs> I, I think how you implement it and how you build it yeah. um, actually has a lot better impact on the cost than mm. the platform than the platform itself. The yeah. individual components all tend to be, mm. you know, relatively similar priced. Um, but you do see some people who will take a traditional, ET, a traditional approach using an ETL tool mm. um, within their data lake um, and build things the way they did on their on-premise system um, mm -hmm. within the within the cloud, which you still can do. That's probably more expensive than if you build it in a way that really leverages the yeah, the cloud that functionality. Makes, that makes sense. Now, I suppose with the data lake, that probably works best if you're extracting your data into a tool like Power BI um, or Tableau. Mm -hmm. uh, however, most most large organisations would recommend going down a lake house architecture. So with a lake house architecture, we're able to combine the benefits of both a data lake and a data warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, we're, when we're working in the SAP space, the SAP data is complex, and it's a lot more complex than people sort of realise sometimes. Uh, we also have a lot of fast changing data, whether that's purchase orders, sales orders, maintenance orders, projects. So it's important that you sort of understand what your fast changing data is, what the data is that might change, and the data that won't, and the architecture's got patterns to deal with them. Now, yeah. as the organisation gets bigger and the data volumes get bigger, um, dealing with the complexity of that data, the changing nature of the data, we can model, um, model that a lot better in a data warehouse versus, versus a data lake. Mm -hmm. okay. And the nice thing we've got now with the technology platforms is the serverless nature of them means we really only have to pay for what we use. So from a commercial um, perspective, it's now a lot more feasible to have both a data lake and data warehouse working together. And then from an end user and technology um, perspective, these platforms now make it really easy through one interface to query both the data warehouse and the data lake um, at the same time through the one interface. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I guess next up, could you talk me through some of the traps and tips for SAP customers moving to cloud native um, data platform and AWS or Azure? Yeah, sure. So I guess the first point is, if you're coming from an SAP background, it, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, those skills that you've learned are still relevant. Um, so as long as you understood what was happening behind the scenes, you know, the Delta Logic change logs, semantic groups, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. um, all that knowledge is transferable and relevant. Mm -hmm. um, 
having the proven patterns and standard is really important. So full loads, delta loads, how you handle those scenarios. Um, in SAP, BW, SAP took care of that for you, just tick the right box and it was done. Mm -hmm. um, but on cloud native platforms, you know, you have greater flexibility, but you need those, to put those architectural patterns and, and development standards in place yourself. Um, and it is important you have these because from an, you know, from a implementation, you probably have, you know, a couple hundred data sources from SAP. So you want something that's reusable across those. I mean, as David mentioned, the, the SAP data models are complex um, and the data can change frequently, frequently. So you need to understand, you know, what won't change, what can change, you know, and what's very likely to change. Um, and how do you handle those scenarios? So again, that's where those patterns um, are important. And the serverless nature of, of the cloud platforms has lots of advantages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can load high volumes of data at pretty low cost, you know, with almost limitless amount of services. Mm -hmm. And when you say high volume, how big, big is that? Oh, you can parallelize things as much as you like. So yeah. it's, it's still important to package things up into sizable chunks. You don't want to, yeah. you know, if you're going, like a AWS Lambda function has 15 minute runtime, so you want to make sure that you can process it in within that 15 minutes. Yeah, but again, it's important to understand the data because you still need to know um, when you need to enforce um, load or loading orders and um, referential integri integrity is another key one. Um, and then finally, I'd say that data lakes don't enforce a primary key. So, you know, if, you use, if you're coming from BW or a traditional um, data warehouse on a traditional database, everything's got a primary key. Um, and not enforcing primary keys can cause duplications in data um, and in your queries, which, you know, you don't want. So having those patterns and, and standards are, are really important. In terms of the market at the moment, obviously there's a lot of projects kicking off, teams that are being built. Be keen to understand what your three imperatives are when you're putting together a project team. All right. So the key ones I've got down is they have to have the, people have to have the technical aptitude for the role that they're going into. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they need years of experience or technical expertise in the exact thing that they're, do they're doing. If someone's been doing Tableau for the last five years and is really good at it, um, and they want to go join a company which is primarily using Power BI, those mm -hmm. skills can move over. The same if someone's been using you know, Microsoft Azure and they want to go do AWS. Mm -hmm. It's more that aptitude to understand data, um, understand how to translate business requirements, how to model data. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, which is important because some of that comes down to how your mind's wired and some of that's yeah, hard to learn if your mind's not wired the right way. Mm -hmm. um, then they need to be really good at working within a team. Um, ideally, you want someone who naturally bounces ideas off other people, um, naturally bounces ideas and designs off other people. Um, that they naturally review each other's work and they're prepared to help out, help out their teammates. Mm -hmm. This bit's really important because you know, there's so much happening when you're in a large data project. It's really hard for an individual to think of to think of everything. Uh, yeah. If they're able to bounce their work off other people, bounce their ideas off other people, you end up with a lot better solution. And you don't really want to be in an environment where you've got to force that on everyone. Yeah, so just trying to find people who will collaborate well together. Yeah. Then probably the last two. Um, and, and the more senior people get, the more important this next one becomes. But even at a junior level, it's still really useful um, the ability to explain their ideas and convince and convince people who don't understand the technical detail of what they're doing so in mm -hmm. the data space we do some quite complex stuff um, and and there can be a lot of different pieces of code and a lot of different things which we build um, it's really important that we can explain what we're doing to people who don't who don't understand the detail mm -hmm. the the final one is then having an ability to sort of reconcile, build and test what they're doing. And ideally do that up front. Ideally be able to have a mindset where you go, right, I'm gonna build something which takes data from over here, run through these transformations, create these metrics which someone's gonna report on. Mm -hmm. um, before you start that, you really need to think about, right, how am I gonna prove that it's right? How am I gonna test that? Yeah. Um, Cause you see a lot of cases where you spend two times as much time testing and fixing a solution as you do, as you do building it. Perfect. And then this one's for sort of upcoming leaders in the market. Obviously, you've been, I can imagine you've been on many projects in your time. Throughout them projects, do you have a, what was your greatest failure that you could think of and what did you learn from this? Yeah, I've gone with this one. I've gone for a project I did a long time ago. Yeah. Back when I did sort of my first major project as a, mm -hmm. as a FICO league on that SAP space. But it was one where we did a lot of stuff in the SAP finance and then also reporting afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I designed 
what I thought at the time was a really good activity-based costing solution. Yeah. Um, you know, it met all the met all the <clears throat> business requirements. Pretty much used every bit of SAP functionality that was available available in that space. And at the time, I thought it was a great solution. But we ended up doing work for that customer for quite a few years afterwards. Yeah. Um, the challenge with it was it was too complex. No one, you know, most of the people out in user land didn't understand yeah. it. And over the next year, it really ended up getting diluted down to something, you know, to something substantially simpler. Yeah. My question's a bit more of, I guess, a fun one, but what would you tell your 21-year-old self um, uh, if you were 21 again? Um, but, yeah, I guess might have changed now that with the pandemic and everything as well. <laughs> Well, I think back to when I, you know, when, when I when I start when I start when I started in this space, um, and working on quite large projects where, you know, at the time there was no remote working, you had to be on, you know, you had to be on site. So there was a particular project on Queenstown in Queensland, sorry, which I was working on for a, um, for a couple of years, and there was periods of that where we ended up working, you know, really long hours, a lot of learnings out of it, but it was also quite painful. So the key things sort of out of that which I think important you know one is sort of try and keep things in perspective there are times when um, there are times when you need to work in this industry where you need to work longer hours than a milestone Mm -hmm. but you can't solve every problem by working longer hours and if you're going month after month of working long hours something's wrong and you need to take a different approach Um, so first two key things out of this one is understand how you're going to reconcile and test the solution before you build it And if someone comes up with the idea that the way you're going to reconcile and test it is you're going to compare the reports that you build to the reports that came out of a 15-year-old legacy system that no one understands how it works and expect them to match exactly, that's not really a a solution. So you really need to think through how you're going to test and reconcile and have that agreed up front. The other key thing is... In a lot of cases, in a lot of cases in the data space, you end up having um, you know, project managers or key decision makers who don't really understand what you're doing, and especially if you're working in the SAP space, you know, a lot of your decision makers in the SAP space are really ERP people, not data people. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you need to learn to explain, um, you need to learn to explain what you're doing, what's required. Um, the challenges to people who don't necessarily understand it in detail yeah. and this is an area I know I struggle with initially and I see a lot of people going through and you can go through the point and you go right this just isn't the right place for me my mm-hmm. yeah you know, my project manager or my manager doesn't understand what I'm doing mm-hmm. but the problem is if you're in a project-based industry um, you're gonna you're probably going to be in this position 70% of the time so you can't necessarily change the people you're going to be working with you need to look at what you can do to you know to better explain your the challenges and what you need to do to people who, the people who aren't technical yeah. yeah fake it till you make it did you want to say what uh, you tell your 21 year old self Jay? yeah I, I was going to try and keep it data focused since it's i was going to say mine was don't stay at the pub so long but yeah and <laughs> buy bitcoin and stuff like that yeah. no yeah so as dave mentioned the, the importance to, i got my to, first job by staying in the pub Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, actually, earlier on, the pub was a great place to grow yeah, your career. Networking. Yeah, networking. Yeah. I don't know what that is in this day and age. No. <laughs> yeah, but um, the importance to test and reconcile everything. So, um, you know, it can be easy to get lost in the detail mm. and go off on a tangent. Um, if you can get realistic data, production data, if you've got it, great. Um, you know, use a test-driven development approach. You know, test everything, every extract, every transformation, everything you do. Make sure it's tested and reconciled, um, and it's not done until it's tested and reconciled. So yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, and look, that's probably a really key thing because we see lots of projects where you spend this much time building them, and then after it's built, you spent a lot longer trying yeah. to fix all the issues. So if you can do a good job of testing all the little pieces as you're doing them, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. masterpiece at the end. <laughs> um, and um, what? podcast or newsletter book or yeah really helped you with your career it might be recently or it might have been um a while back. look i don't know if there's any particular um one that i can call out i, I tend to make sure i follow you know I, I keep up to date and follow um you know what's happening both in the area which i'm working in and also the areas around it um mm. at the moment i probably do that more by using um linkedin and following people you know, mm. both following organizations and following um following individuals and and then linkedin seems to be quite good at sort of just um yeah 
the algorithm. bringing up sort of mm -hmm. topical articles, reading those articles, and then when you want to sort of dig into something a bit deeper, sort of mm -hmm. taking that hopping on hopping on the yeah. internet and searching into it. I think that's important that you do keep it up to date with what's happening in your area. And if you're working in one technology, say you're working in AWS, you know, also follow what's happening in Azure or what's happening in Google. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so to add to that, I guess for me, Magic Quadrant's always a good go-to to, to see what else is happening in the market because mm -hmm. it, it pretty much covers everything. You can see what's trending, what, what's doing really well. Um, yeah, but I guess I've always benefited from actually getting in, getting my hands dirty. Mm. So if something new comes out or something different you don't know about, just get in, set up a scenario, try it out. Because yeah. um, you're yeah. still quite hands on yourself, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. and I, I do enjoy just figuring stuff out and seeing how it works. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't don't be scared to get get in yeah. there and have a go. Yeah. Stay on the tools. Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, well, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure starting our first podcast this way. Thank you both for being on the first podcast for our mini-series. Um, very excited to see how it all pans out. Um, but otherwise, enjoy the rest of your week.